Praise the Lord. So we're on week three of agape, which are going through the characteristics of an environment of love. And talked about being a culture of honor two weeks ago. Talked about being a culture that values truth-telling last week. Uh, and the topic for tonight is offense. Uh, a culture of love, an environment love, is one that's free of offense. Offense is resentment brought about by a perceived insult to oneself, one's values, or one's principles. Resentment brought about by a perceived insult to oneself, values, principles, a disregard for what you think is because right. Love and offense cannot coexist because love does not seek its own. Love is not selfish, so you cannot be offended because you can't be insulted if you're in love because there's nothing to insult. And so this is important uh, that we get this. For a community of love, there can be no offense because they're the antithesis of one another. Offense is only operative in a self-righteous ecosystem. Let me break this. A self-righteous ecosystem. Self-right. Self-righteousness is I know what is correct. And I can only be offended if you're violating that. If I'm living in an ecosystem where I, it's all about me. Self-righteous. I have it figured out. You following me? That's the only ecosystem that can be offended. Love doesn't seek its own. It's patient. It's kind. It doesn't keep a record. Right? It's, it's selfless. So how can you be offended? Following me? Yeah. All right. I'm just introducing this. Two types of offense I'm going to talk about. One I'm going to spend a little bit of time. One I'm going to spend most of the time. Uh, two ways. There's two things that we often get offended with. These are, there's probably more, but these are two that I felt the Lord wanted me to talk about tonight. The first is that we can get offended by sin. All right? Uh, we're offended by sin when we feel justified to operate in judgment. And it reveals that there's a mercy issue in our life. And this is important. Uh, because if we are living in offense, we're useless to God. You cannot love and be offended at the same time. And so if you are offended by sin, you are completely useless to be used to bring any type of transformation to an environment or a person or whatever that is operating in a sinful way. All right, Matthew 7, 1 says, Do not judge so that you will not be judged. <laughs> it's like really simple, right? Do not judge, so you will not be judged. There are as no, I've read all the gifts of the Spirit. None of them is a spiritual police force. Anybody found that in there? No. There's no such thing as a spiritual police force. There's nobody that is given a right in a new covenant Christianity to be a judge of another person. Jesus says, Matthew 7, 1, the most famous sermon of all, do not judge so that you will not be judged. All right, John 8 is a story that's marked my life. The interesting con in adultery. You familiar with this? So she's caught in the very act of adultery. The interesting context of this story is that this woman, and sorry guys, I'm just jumping right in the deep end because I got a lot to cover tonight. I know you're like, man, where was like the soft warm up? You're just going straight towards the goo. All right, but in John 8, uh, they're trying to get Jesus trapped. The Pharisees are extremely upset with him. Just the night before, he offended them. And then he went to the mountain, came back, and began teaching the next morning. So they're trying to catch him in, in something that they can accuse him, right? They're very upset with Jesus at this point. And it's interesting to me that the way they're trying to snare the righteous Holy One is by getting someone caught in sin because they know he's not going to judge her. Isn't that profound? That he had such a reputation for being merciful that the way they were going to trip him up is throw a sinner at his feet. Wow. For some reason, I, I long for the day when people, well, there's such a reputation in the church of being merciful that they're going to throw the worst of the worst at our feet. Yeah. And be like, see, they don't even, you know, they're not, they don't believe in justice. Right? That, like, that's how they're trying to catch Jesus, because he's so merciful. They know he's going to be merciful. And Jesus says, you know, they got the stones. This is what the law says to do. And uh, Jesus says, he who's without sin, throw the first stone. 
They, of course, drop the stones, walk away. And it's interesting, the only, only person justified to throw the stone, the only person there without sin was Jesus, and he was the only one ready to give mercy. And Jesus is the exact representation of the nature of God. Right? If we're living in an environment, if we have a theology that is justifying us in judgment towards sinners, we are, we, our theology needs to change. Jesus is perfect theology. And he had a reputation for being merciful. Right? He speaks the truth in love. That's last week. He speaks the truth in love to this woman. He does not condone sin. He does not ever compromise with it. He does never, he's not saying that's okay. He speaks the truth in love. But this woman comes, he gives mercy, then speaks the truth in love. And I think that order is profound. Because once the people experience love, they're ready to hear truth. You following me? Um, there was a, a time, and I used to do, uh, I'd have a sign that says free spiritual readings. Funny for evangelism, right? This is how I would, I felt the Lord, I had a heart for, I do have a heart for new age spirituality. I think they're truth seekers, and they have had usually wounds that have veiled them from Jesus. They don't think that they can find it in Christianity. A lot of them have uh, prophetic giftings that were never given permission or were squelched in the church. So they've gone to an environment where there's more permission. So I have a real heart for New Age spirituality. And I made this sign. I'm going to figure out how to demonstrate love to them. I'm going to give them free spiritual readings. They won't have to pay me. I had many of them offer to pay me after receiving it. Funny. I said, no, this is Jesus. He doesn't charge. Um, he just wants your life not your money. <laughs> but uh, so I had this sign and people would come from all types of different walks of life and I'd give them words. They'd start crying. It was, it was an awesome thing. Some people in this room have gone with me before. And uh, I remember one time this guy came flamboyantly homosexual and I couldn't, I couldn't see anything. I couldn't see anything but what offended my uh, paradigm of right and wrong. And I was completely incapable of loving. I didn't, I was stumbling all over myself. Afterwards, I said, Lord, what was that? He said, you're offended by the sin. And you're incapable of love. And it was like, dang it, man. Like, heal my heart. Make me merciful like you. Because Jesus isn't offended by sin. Woman comes at the well who is in uh, all these relationship past. Right? This is the well of Samaria. She's coming in the middle of the day. You don't go to wells in the middle of the day in Middle Eastern culture because it's burning hot. She's there because she's full of shame. He doesn't see shame. He doesn't see adultery. He doesn't see all her past and brokenness. He just had mercy for her, and he saw an evangelist. I was blind. All I could see was a man that was lost, but Jesus didn't see a woman that was lost. He saw an evangelist because his heart was in a place of mercy, and God can only use a vessel of mercy because mercy triumphs over judgment. Amen? Amen. We sang it. We got to live it. We are not justified in living in judgment towards sin. We are at times justified in given authority, which was last week, to speak the truth in love, but we are not justified to live in a place of judgment. We cannot be offended by sin because we can't be used by him. And he wants us to get right into the midst of it. We don't want to be the Pharisees out saying, why is Jesus there with all those sinners? Judging sin. Jesus was right there with them, but uncompromising. He was holy. They knew he was holy. Peter's like, get away from me. You're, I'm a sinner. Right? People know he's holy, but they like to be around him. We need to embody that. That's all I got. That's all the time I've got. Okay? Can't be offended by sin. I just had to jump right in. Is that fair? Okay. Uh, this is the big one that the Lord wanted me to talk about, and I think this is going to hit some chords tonight. Um, we get offended by favor. It's very important to us because we're building here a culture that's going to move and exercise and operate in the charismata of God. Right? We're building a spiritual culture, a supernatural culture, a church built without hands. We're going to give the Holy Spirit permission to do what he wants to do. It's his church. The charismata, those are gifts of grace. Grace, charis, favor. Gifts of favor, gifts of grace. Grace is unmerited favor. Grace is the empowering presence of God. Right? So if we're going to live in a culture where we give the gifts, these Gifts of favor, these gifts of grace, permission to access, we can't be offended by them. We can't be offended by favor. Right? I believe strongly in the priesthood of all believers. 
What that means is there's no separation between pulpit and pew. We've heard this, right? All right? No, I'm tired of the separation. I'm tired of the separation between pulpit and pew. I'm tired of this. All right? And I'm tired of this as well. But John Maxwell says, don't take a fence down until you know why it was first put up. Anybody heard that before? It's a good line. Don't take a fence down until you figure out why it was first put up. The fence, this fence between pulpit and pew that's been very active in Western Christianity for the last couple centuries, maybe. Uh, it was put there... Uh, because it, it actually helps preserve, preserve and, disting- and like distinguish the authority structure of the church, right? It's actually a preservation mechanism to make authority really clearly designated, right? And what this does uh, is it's a, it's a human attempt to create order, right? 1 Corinthians 14.40 says, let everything be done in order, right? We've taken that from a human's perspective, but Paul's actually writing that in the perspective of building a supernatural culture, which is the church of Corinth. So it's actually not human man-made order. I'm going to make this order to what like my mind likes. It's actually the order of heaven. It's a supernatural order. It's the sequencing of the Holy Spirit. If you weren't here when Rob McCorkle, he described this word. It's a beautiful word. It's just like this bit by bit by bit in the spirit. It's the spirit created order, right? But we've tried to create it on our own strength, right? Out of this place of preservation, out of this place of control. So this fence was put up to create order because we need structure. We need to make sure that authority, right, that we know how to do this thing, okay? And uh, the problem is that the structure has fear in it, and it leads to the disempowerment of the body of Christ, Right? You end up having powerful and unpowerful, favored and unfavored, the elite and the non-elite, the normal. Right? And this was very much the pharisaical model of leadership that Jesus kind of crashes into. And you can see this elitism that was created because it's normally it's the favored, it's the anointed, and it's the non-anointed. And what this does is it creates order, it creates structure, it creates control. It takes away the mess because we don't like messes. We want things to be clean, 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 clean. Because messy, woo! Right? It's funny. We want church to be so clean, but like our lives are so messy. But we want it when we all come together to be so clean. <laughs> it's like, I, I don't know why. That's crazy. That does, that's impossible. Right? But you see it when in the, the story when Jesus heals the man born blind, and he starts telling him, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. All I know is I was blind and now I see. And the Pharisees quip, they go, Are you a man born in sin going to teach us? Right? There's no priesthood of all believers. There was the priesthood, and then there was the non-priest. Are you following me? Okay, this is not a good fence. I'm just trying to, like, why is the fence there? All right, what happens is that leadership gains control, which is clean. It's nice. But what they sacrifice is the move of God, is the movement, is the revival, is the kingdom fruitfulness, is the multiplication. Right? Jesus' followers, his pew sitters, what did they do? They, they turned the world upside down, right? There wasn't like, there were no powerless followers of Jesus, right? He didn't have this separation. He was like in them, amongst them, with them, empowered them, and they, you know, his, his ceiling was their floor. They went to the next level, right? That is why it's a priesthood of all believers, because that's how Jesus did it. That's what Jesus modeled, right? And then Peter says, we're a priesthood or a kingdom of priests, priesthood of all believers. Now we've all been anointed, right? That is, that's why we're Christians, Little anointed ones. All right, this is exciting. Should be excited here, okay? We're anointed, right? Uh, but, but do you understand why the fence is put up? Brings this sense of control. It's comfortable. It fits really all of kind of Western society. So, do, 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 do. Nice organizational structure. And I'm not saying that that's all bad. There is structure. But it's not man-made structure. It's not created in fear. Okay, so now I want to engage in the mess because I believe in a culture of empowerment. I believe in a priest of all believers. I believe that it's not about works. It's not about education. It's not about how smart you are. It's not about, it's, it's about the grace of God, right? It's about his anointing. And we're all anointed. We have all been given of the spirit on all flesh. I will pour out my spirit, even my sons and my daughters, the, the slaves, the female slaves, they'll prophesy, right? Th- this, is, this is the birthday of the church and that's the verse. Movement is the spirit came upon and empowered people, 
All right, the charismatic movement is the most rapidly growing movement in the history of the world. It's 750 million, roughly, in the last 110 years. You do the math, it's freaky how many people that means a day. But it is the most wide-sweeping movement ever. It's overtaking the planet. And one of the main reasons, this is just from a purely like socio- sociologist looking at and trying to understand this, it's the priesthood of believers. It's that the Spirit was just put on people and any average Joe could go to Africa and turn the world upside down. <laughs> Pretty crazy, right? Right? Because in the church, you know, they, they've done studies and they say that women actually flourish on the mission field because there wasn't organizational control and structure that shut and quenched their voices. And so on the mission field, they'd go out and turn the world upside down and the stats show they're, they're like way more effective than men have been. Whoa! Right? This is kind of crazy. It's really a priesthood of all believers. All my sons and my daughters will prophesy. All right, you see what I'm saying? But this gets messy. You have to start engaging with things. It's not so clean cut. Right, wrong. Buh, buh, buh. Okay. There's a huge gaping vulnerability with this. Huge gaping vulnerability with a true recognition, when a people really understand that it is just about the grace, the empowering presence of God upon his people. And that is that pride can manifest. It has so much. Pride and selfish ambition can manifest so easily. Right? Because, well, why? Let me, let me read a couple of verses. Ephesians 4. We're going to get to, uh, if you can turn your Bibles to, Number 16, because I'm going to bop pretty quick there. Um, but I'm going to read this from uh, Ephesians 4. This is 1 through 7. It says, Therefore, I impl- uh, as the prisoner of the Lord, I implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you've been called, with all humility, gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, also as you were called to one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who's over all and through all and in all. What's the key word there? The first six verses. One. Paul is like, this is how important it is for you to be one in love. And this is why. On verse 7. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Whoa! thought we were all the same. And we're one body, but grace is dispensed differently. We're one body, but favor is given in different ways to different people. We're one body, but this is not like a huge democracy. There's authority that God dispenses upon people. Who would agree with that statement? How much authority did Billy Graham have in this nation? Did everybody, anybody else have that much authority? I don't know if everybody's ever had as much authority as Billy Graham had in this nation, right? God dispenses his grace differently. He dispenses his authority differently. So now we have this priesthood of all believers, right? We're not controlling, but the authority is dispensed differently. The favor is given out differently, and you have this, right? We have these people. We're trying to learn our place in freedom, in love, not in control and fear, Is this making sense? So what happens if I'm feeling insecure and prideful and somebody else, they have this favor on their lives. "Mm, I want that myself. I'm going to throw a fit. I'm going to do whatever. I'm going to self-promote. Do you see what I'm saying? It's It's a structure built without hands. It's not human control and fear driving an institution. It's a house made without hands. It's authority. It's a government of grace. Whoa. This is crazy. This is like not humanly. This is like not of the earth. (laughs) It's like supernatural, (laughs) right? Like three of you are like, yeah, I kind of follow what you're saying. I'm just going to say yes. (laughs) All right, you at number 16? I'm going to try to bring this to life and flesh this a little bit. This is called Korah's Rebellion. In my Bible. So, so now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, Dathan, and Abiram, the sons of Liab, 
yada, yada, yada. Okay, verse 2. They rose up before Moses together with some of the sons of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, chosen in the assembly, men of renown. They assembled together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You've gone far enough, for all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is in their midst. So why do you exalt yourself above the assembly of the Lord? We're having a, 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 a rebellion here within the priesthood. All right, Korah is offended. He gets the men of renown. So uh, this is why this is, this is important. This is about, this is to church leaders. This is like to the real deal, the leaders of Israel. Moses and Aaron, right? They're leading. Moses got his staff. Aaron's got his staff that buds. That's like a chapter later, but that's okay, right? These are men of authority. Within the priesthood, there's been a, a, a dispensation of grace and favor and authority within the old covenant priesthood, right? This is important because we're a new covenant priesthood. Priesthood's not just the Levites, it's all of us, right? So this, this is pertinent here, okay? And they're, they're offended. They're offended saying, you've gone too far. You, what, why are you leading us? The, the Lord's on all of us. We're all anointed. Why are you the ones that are being exalted? You've gone too far. They're jealous. They are jealous of Moses and Aaron. And they're, 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 and they're coming with an offended heart. You're jealous. And this is Moses' reply in verse 8. Then Moses says to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi, you priesthood. Is it not enough for you that the God of Israel separated you from the rest of the tabernacle of the Lord of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to minister to them, and that he's brought you near, Korah, and all your brothers, sons of Levi, with you? And are you seeking for the priesthood also? Therefore you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. But as for Aaron, who is he that he would grumble against him? Moses is showing, no, you're actually jealous, and your issue's not with me. Your issue's with the Lord. This is, this is, this is what I'm going to, and I'm going to unpack this. Your issue's with the Lord. Your issue's not with me. And I love, you want to see a humble leader. Moses, it says when they come to him in verse 4, uh, he falls on his face. He doesn't get pissed. <laughs> I think I get pissed. <laughs> I just split the Red Sea. And you're asking me why I'm the leader? <laughs> right? Do you know how long I was in the wilderness? 40 years doing nothing, taking care of another dude's sheep. Right? He doesn't, he doesn't get offended. He just falls on his face. Humble leadership, dead to self right there. That's a sanctified leader. And he's in the old covenant. All right, but I want to unpack. He, he's trying to show the people... In this priesthood, the priest, your issue is not with me, it's with God. He's exposing jealousy in the heart of Korah. All right, jealousy creates an environment that attracts and breeds offense. All right, it's like I think of like standing water, you know, where mosquitoes like fester. And at night you go there and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to die because of all the disease that's going to get on me as these thousands of bugs consume me to suck my blood, right? That is jealousy. It is like this low-standing, swampy water that is attracting a breeding ground for these nasty, de diseased vermins called offense. And this is how offense, uh, this is the process of offense taking root and becoming jealousy. What happens is when we're jealous, uh, we, are, we don't like jealousy, right? We know jealousy is bad. Right? I think non-Christians would even say we know, like we fundamentally know as people, jealousy is bad, right? It's bad. I shouldn't feel this. So what we do when we're jealous is we're actually looking for things that will, be, that will justify us in being jealous. Right? Does that make sense? So let me just like give you a biblical example of this in Matthew 13. You can turn there. So this is Jesus coming to his hometown, Nazareth, right? And he's awesome. He's very favored. Would you agree? God put a lot of favor on Jesus. 
uh, and he comes and uh, he's uh, preaching. He begins preaching. So this is Matthew 13, 54. He comes to his hometown and begins teaching them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Right? They are astonished at the favor of God on his life. But I want you to watch the justification. They're jealous. And I want you to watch how it plays out. Verse 55. Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. Why is Jesus exalting himself like that? What? Right? They're, they're jealous. But it's like, no, that can't be right. I grew up with him. He's the carpenter's kid. He's just one of us. We're all anointed. Why would God be using him? I, he, there's nothing special about him. And you start justifying this offense to come down and why I don't really actually have to listen to you. Right? And it's actually justifying why I don't have to submit to you. Whoa. Because there's favor on your life. There's grace on your life. And the way that grace comes into my life is when I submit and yield myself to it. I don't want to because he's just Jesus. I know him. Right? And this, they, they justify this jealousy and they take offense. You following me? So jealousy is an environment that attracts and breeds offense. The truth is that the kingdom is an upside-down kingdom. Authority is distributed through gifts of grace, gifts of favor, not merit. God chooses the weak and the foolish things to shame the wise and the strong. What that means is that favor on your life is meant for you to be a spectacle of grace, not to get arrogant about. And take Israel as an example. God chose Israel because they were the greatest of all nations? No, the least. An old dude who couldn't even have a kid. (laughs) That's who he chose. Why? Because he wanted to show the world it's not about man's strength. It's not about you earning yourself back into some type of self-righteous position of favor. It's to be a spectacle of grace. So if God's favors on your life, the point is it's not about you. But somehow Israel became like so arrogant. Like, yeah, we're the elite and the Gentiles, they don't get saved, right? They veered away from their calling, which was a humble calling, to the spiritual elitism, which still is rampant within Jewish uh, Judaism all throughout the world today. They are some of the most racist people I've ever been around. If you want to go to the Temple Mount in Israel. You look at them the wrong way, they'll spit at your face because you're a lowly Gentile. So that's just a plug to don't get prideful when favor's on your life because it's not about you. In the kingdom under God's authority and leadership, everyone is significant. Everyone is fulfilled. Okay, get this. In his government, this government of grace... He's designed it for you to be fulfilled perfectly. He's designed it for you to be powerful, to be used. Okay, this is the problem. We, his wisdom wounds our pride. Okay, and it causes jealousy to manifest, which breeds offense. And we shut it down because of our pride, because of sin, because of our offense. All right, his wisdom wounds our pride. We don't like the way he does it. Let me give you examples, because this can happen when you are in authority. This can happen when you are under authority. You're in authority. Somebody underneath you starts shining the favor of God's on them in such a way that maybe God's using them more than he's using you. What do you do? Oh, you shouldn't exert yourself like that. I didn't give you permission. You can justify, 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 because you're jealous. right? If it breeds jealousy, and you operate in a way that pulls, withholds, that's sin. That's offense. Right? You're under authority. Right? You start comparison. You start jealous. You start looking for reasons, nitpicking why you're not right, why you're not doing it good. You know, you're, just, you're no different than me. Why, 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 why is that happening to you? Why did it, right? And you withhold. That's sin. That's judgment. Judgment. That's offense. Does this make sense? 
Jealousy. When we get jealous, it doesn't matter what position we're in, in authority, under authority. When we get jealous, we're showing that we have, we're, we're breeding this nesting ground of offense. We're breeding this vile substance that now can wreak influence into this government of God, this government of grace. Okay, and start withholding. We start withholding, and this is what this is what's this is. I'm going to personify what we're doing. Why are we doing this? Why, why, why? If somebody under my leadership shines and I get jealous, why? What am I protecting? Why is this working? I'm trying to establish and maintain my own autonomy, my own God likeness, my own ability that I'm in control. I'm the leader. I want to do it my way. Right? You're manifesting pride. And it's no different. And anyway, if you get jealous, you're trying to maintain your ability that I'm going to live my life my way. I'm going to make my own decisions. I don't want to follow this upside down kingdom where you have to like die to live and serve to be, become the greatest. And like, like, I don't want to do it that way. I want to do it my way. I'm offended that you would use that person. I'm not going to submit to them. I'm offended by that. I'm going to do it my way. Following me? Out of the mouth of infant babies, you've established strength. Do you have the humility to submit to a child if the Lord wants to speak to you through a child? Do you have the humility to submit to your brother if God wants to use your brother? Do you, who, who do you, do you have the humility to just say, I'm going to submit to Christ. I don't care who he's on. If I see his favor, I'm getting under it. I'm going to honor it. And I'm going to submit so that I can receive it. Are you following me? This isn't about the special. This is a priesthood of all believers. Ephesians 5.21 says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Agape love cherishes the opportunity to submit and recognize and value and honor someone when the favor of God is on their life. Right? It is a government of grace. Okay? It's, it's a government where it's literally, he forms this whole thing with his own presence, with his own empowering presence. That is what grace is. So when he dispenses grace upon the body, he is giving himself, he's resting himself upon us as a church. And when he starts moving and we say, no, I'm going to withhold, I'm offended right now that you would use someone and not me. I've gone this long. I've done this much. I've prayed this much. They're just a new baby Christian. I'm offended that you would put favor like that on that person. You know what you're saying? You're saying, no, I don't want Jesus. On, I don't want Jesus. We're deeply doing. You, right, and this is what you're then even more deeply doing. You are withholding. You are denying that person their God-given calling. They were designed to have influence on your life. They were designed to be a vehicle that would dispense grace into your life. You're denying them the fulfillment of their call. And then you're denying yourself it as well because you need that grace. Because we are poor in spirit and desperate for his presence. We start creating all these walls and offense just wreaks havoc. People say, why isn't, why isn't the church fulfilling its biblical mandate? Pride, jealousy, offense, jacking everything up. Is this true? Yeah. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. My yearning is that we be a people that revere and honor and love above all else the presence of Jesus. So that when I see him on anyone, I'll be the first to submit to you. And, and, and when I'm jealous, like this is, when we're jealous, jealousy comes right at the door of your destiny. You know where jealousy is going to manifest? You're going to get jealous because it's what you're supposed to get. And jealousy is actually trying to push you away from receiving the very grace that God is ordaining for you to receive in your life. You get jealous when God's using someone some way? Get under them. Honor them. Like, go. You see what I'm saying? Submit to them. The way you kill jealousy is you submit yourself. Yes, 
God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. As I was preparing this message, the Lord convicted me. There was a man, there was a guy who's a couple years older than me in, in school. Powerful leader, powerful spiritual leader. Had so much favor on his life. Those were years when I had none. None. And whatever I did was thwarted. And you know what I did? I judged him. I criticized him because I was offended that God would use him. He wouldn't use me. That's when it just like raw, that's what it all boils down to, an ugly little root. I was convicted. The Lord said, you need to message him. You need to repent to him. And he said, you missed my grace, by the way. He said, you need to repent. You need to restore it. So I sent him a message this morning. I said, hey, the influence you had was remarkable. I was so insecure. I had to prove myself that I was powerful. I, I, I resisted. I opposed it. I distanced myself. I criticized you in my mind. And I said, and I missed it. And I said, I want to give honor where honor is due. You inspired me, even though it was from afar. And I have a regret that I didn't receive what I was supposed to receive from you. Because God established you as authority in my life. And I thwarted it. Because I wanted to support my own independent ecosystem. Where I could be the one. Going to earn it with my own merit. Gives grace to the humble. And grace is like water flows to the lowest place. The humble will find it because they're going to go to the lowest place. I don't care if you're on a baby. I want you, Jesus. I have so much reverence in my heart. I have so much love in my heart for your presence. I don't care where you are. I don't care where you're doing. I don't care who you're using. I want it. That's how I've lived my life for, for, year, for years now. I don't care. I just want Jesus. I want to be the lowest one. I want to be the first one on the floor. I want to be the, wherever you're moving, I want to be there. I don't want to miss out. Don't pass me by. That's how you receive grace. That's how you receive favor. You didn't dispense it the same. I want to close and I just, uh, I want to give a call to repentance, but told you it's a theme this season of our church. He's renewing our minds. He's renewing our hearts. He's transforming us into the image of love. Because it's a people of love. It's people that love his presence that will overcome offense. Feeling jealousy isn't sin. Acting on it is. But I want to give a call to repentance. Um, jealousy is killed when we confess it and we submit and we give honor where honors due. And I think there's many in this room that tonight as I'm speaking, you know, there's people that you've withheld your affections from. There's people that you've distanced yourself from. And they are established authorities in your life. You know it. Not because of their education, not because of their merit, because God has something on their life that you need. And I think there may be people in this room, and this is my challenge. I'm just going to invite you to stand in a minute, but if you're standing you're saying, I'm going to make it right tonight or tomorrow if you can't do it tonight. Um, but there's some people that you need to call. There's some people you need to message. And if I'm going to give you a moment to just stand. And that's basically you're telling all of us. You're telling the Lord, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it now. The best obedience is quick obedience. You do it. And uh, I just, this is just serious stuff, you know. I don't want mosquitoes flying around my life. I don't want an ecosystem that just spreads disease everywhere. And that's what happens when we're operating in offense. Amen? Uh, so if there's people in here, I just encourage you that you have a conversation before you leave. And if there's people out there, if you're standing, you're saying, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it as soon as I can. Uh, so I don't really want music or anything. I'm just going to give you an opportunity to stand. So go ahead and stand, and then I'm going to pray. Praise the Lord. And I just want everyone to join in prayer. You don't need to stand if you're not standing, but I just want you to join in prayer. God, I pray that you make us a people, that there is no offense. You make us unoffendable. You transform us in love. I pray that we'll be a people that are quick to kill jealousy. God, that we allow jealousy to be a force that drives us into deeper submission to one another and most of all, to Christ. We honor you as Lord. I thank you for what you're doing. And God, we just say we're all in. Continue to convict, reveal, show, and transform us.
how we can become more of love and more like you. Thank you, God, that you're breaking the yoke of offense, that you're destroying self-righteous pride, and you're liberating us to be the sons and daughters that you created us to be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.